There are numerous ways that we can seek to connect to African culture and heritage. We can do so through literature, music, art, history, paintings, sculpture. Today, in this episode, we commemorate 186 years of emancipation in Trinidad and Tobago through fashion and beauty. We're here at Renee's Natural Hair Styling and Braiding Services to speak to co-owner Catherine Surratt about the freedoms of wearing your own natural hair. So Catherine, thank you so much for opening your doors to WhatsApp. How long have you been practicing on natural hair? Yeah, so my sister and I run this branch and we began in 2013. The actual business, which would be Rennie's Natural Hair Styling and Braiding Services, started in 2012. So prior to that, we were, we were discussing the movement and you know the whole journey in terms of people returning to their natural hair. Definitely, I would say around that time, a lot of people the resurgence definitely grew where people wanted to you know, embrace a more natural lifestyle, a more holistic, healthy lifestyle. And in terms of being able to find options to take care of your entire body, your hair is part of your body. And the options for products for taking care of your natural hair were very limited. And so when a number of people, a lot of local artisans, started creating natural products for your hair and the options of the variety of you know, natural, organic, very healthy products, very wholesome products became more available. A lot more people realized, yes, I too have the option to adequately you know, take care of my hair in a wholesome, healthy way with the products available. So a lot more people now found it accessible or doable to retain to natural hair. I see. Would you say it was taboo to wear your natural African hair? And do you see a turn in the mentality and the behavior of people today? Ooh, that word taboo. <laughs> you know, um, I think yes, it's... Yes, would. <laughs> it's... Well, relative, you know, in different families, different, you know, circles, they would have different opinions on it. But I would say by far the majority are very comfortable with it now. And in terms of, you know, styling options, definitely because of the range and the versatility that natural hair presents, a lot more people feel themselves able to do it. And, you know, what's, what's, your, what's it? Loving the skin you're in, <laughs> you know, and loving the crown that is on your, on your head. So in terms of the taboo, it's normally related to certain styles you know, or certain textures or hair types. So I would say more so the Caribbean, which I call it stereotype of good hair versus bad hair, the Caribbean hair stereotype where if your hair is a certain way when it's natural, then it's fine. We are moving past that. A lot of people, whatever is growing out of your head now, whatever form, shape, you know, texture, length it would take, people are not as concerned as they initially would have been when they wanted a certain, you know, loose what they call the waterfall or the S type curls, you know, the ones where you wet it and your hair suddenly, you know, the curls spring out. Now, that has definitely changed. So whatever, you know, range of hair types or range of curls or lack of curls, whatever's coming out of your hair, people are embracing that now. So the taboo definitely has, or it's being, you know, constantly eroded, which is a good thing. Right. How do you feel about women of African descent wearing wigs and extensions? Do you see it as just a matter of individual style or African women generally still afraid to expose their natural hair? Now, well, for us, um, generally the wigs we use, you know, extensions fall in what we call the protective styling category. So those would generally be styles intended to, you know, put your hair away for a little bit so that you would limit the manipulation. So for people who choose those styles when they're doing it, like I said, in a healthy way, that is not going to damage your hair or, you know, affect your scalp, hurt your strands. Once it's been done safely, sure, run free with it. We have lots right. of options for those styles. In terms of people who, it, when it's linked to your self-identity where I do not feel comfortable with what is growing from my head and so I must hide it or I must present myself in X, Y, and Z, you know, way that is not organic to me or not natural to me. When it becomes an issue of I do not like this identity or this African identity. And you have to hide yes. it at all, by all means. means. Yes, or you have to present somebody else's version of what the, you know, the standard of beauty is. So in terms of, like I said, the wigs, extensions, whatever, if it is a, if it is one that looks very similar to your hair type, but let's say there's a little more length, a little more volume, I would understand that, okay, at this point in time, you're looking for a certain look. But when it becomes, I cannot leave my house, so I am, you know, I do not consider myself beautiful. Or my, or, or your, or my yes. husband cannot see, see me. me. Yes, because I've, I've heard that a few times where a lot of people were yes. saying, especially when they were transitioning, when, when you were moving from, let's say, processed hair into actually trying to embrace and care for your natural hair, a lot of people have said for about a year or two, 
their partner had no idea what was going on with their head. He would have not seen them unless their hair was done in a certain way. And usually, like I said, the certain way with the wigs and weaves is something long and flowing that you know you could run your hands through. You know, so in terms of people using those things, like I said, as a covering to mask what is natural, then that is where I would see that as a problem. Something they would definitely need to, you know, have some personal means of addressing it. Right. In Trinidad and Tobago, up to this day, you still hear people using the phrase good hair, insinuating then that there exists such a thing as bad hair. What do you say to people who use this term? I breathe deeply. <laughs> because um, because in, in terms of the education with the whole movement, like I said, there's a lot of information out there. I know it can be very overwhelming. And normally your family is the, you know, in, talk, in terms of socialization and all of that, the first place you turn to. So if the language around natural hair is this good hair versus bad hair and you know, who has it or who doesn't, and your whole identity or the whole formation in terms of this natural hair journey is surrounded by good hair versus bad hair and what good hair looks like or what good hair feels like, then we're going to have a problem where people, if they fall into the bad hair category, then like I said, their self-worth, their self-esteem is definitely going to be tied to that. There is no such thing as good hair. Say it again. There is no such thing. Loud enough for the people in the Very back. Good. <laughs> no such thing as good hair or bad hair. Generally, if you are going to refer to your hair as bad, that is that means there's some sort of damage that would have occurred that you generally you need to trim or get rid of. All hair, all hair, <laughs> all hair is good hair. And generally, we always say good hair has to be healthy hair. So once your hair is healthy, you are trying your best with what, you know, when it, within your means to take care of your hair, then your hair is good hair. What normally happens, the, what do you want to call it, us during colonialization, with the whole, what is it, lead for school hair, and you know, people having general, what we call tight or coils or more Afro textured hair, then that is, that wasn't desirable at the time. Everybody wanted their hair to be, you know, long and straight. Like I, I always mention, you know, able to run your hands <laughs> through it, which is to me a very strange concept, but you know, that is what was, you know, predominant at the mm. time. So now that you're realizing that because of our, you know, what you call it, multicultural society, you have so many different options in terms of, like I said, what they call phenotypes, you know, how people physically would pre be presented. You cannot expect everybody to fit into this one mold of good hair equaling straight hair. So now that we know <laughs> good hair is healthy hair, everybody should feel comfortable with the knowledge that I have good hair because my hair is healthy hair. Is this, is this also um, associated with that um, neat, keeping your hair neat? Neat is not one of my favorite words. <laughs> yes, you know some establishments, you could have dreadlocks if it's kept neat. neat. And, and that is, I realize, in a lot of the policy, both in schools you know, and in the workplace, that hair must be you know, neat and tidy. And for me, neat is always relative. I know it is possible, like, but there are a lot of products available to, what you want to call it, have your hair lying flat or be smooth. I get that. But the reality is everybody's hair is not going to be able to conform to that standard of every single strand being in place for, you know, the 24 hours or the period of your, your work or your school life. So I think part of the whole process is for people to understand that because of the wide variety of, you know, hair options or hair types, hair textures out there, neat is relative where, like I said, once an active effort is being made to care for your hair, that should be accepted rather than your hair having to conform to the standard of every, you know, hair schlacked into place that is not realistic. Right. Why do you believe it's important to celebrate, indulge, feel, and take pride in your own natural God-given hair and find beauty in what you were born with? Well, you know, I, side note, I'm a history student, you know, well, I would have been what I studied in school. And um, being able to look back and see, you know, in terms of, I don't want to just say development and progress, but in terms of, you know, your ancestry and your heritage, where this was something that you know a lot of people were made to feel ashamed of a lot of people were penalized for like as I, as I mentioned having a certain physical appearance at this point in time we're in the 21st century things have changed you know come full circle <laughs> that we're in a position where in terms of your identity in terms of your ancestry your heritage you know always looking back to, from in terms of where you came from so you know where you are now and where you want to go it's very important to realize that who you are is shaped by your history and part of that history in terms of your hair, you know, your tresses, your locks, whatever you want to call it. What is growing out of your hair, that, that natural crown? 
all of that is shaped by what would have come before. So presently, we have the opportunity in our you know, very diverse society to see not just that we have a wide variety of hair types and you know, a wide variety of products to care for it, but to see that this natural hair this, that is growing from your scalp is so beautiful in its natural state, right? Or in whatever form you decide to wear it in. So in terms of being able to celebrate beauty, like I said, for us as natural stylists, it would come in the form of hair care, but it's deeper than that, where, like I said, it's tied to your self-esteem, it's tied to your identity, it's tied to, you know, who I am and what I stand for in terms of being able to, where we were at a point where you could not have natural hair or you could not celebrate, you couldn't wear it. It had to be covered, it had to be hidden by head wraps and all of that to a point where with the whole black power movement, especially just like breezing past a lot of these things in colonialism, yes. But with the black power movement and people being able to, you know, stand as a sign of rebellion with wearing your afro, you know, contrary to what a lot of the norms of the day would have been to us now where you have lots of accessories, lots of beads, you know, lots of products and all of that. But being able to say, this is my hair, you know, this is who I am. This is this healthy hair journey I'm going on. But more than that, this is my ancestry. This is my heritage. I am proud of it. This is a way of me being able to show, you know, my lineage, to be able to show that all that has happened in terms of the repression, the oppression, the suppression, <laughs> you know, all that would have been trying to keep us down and, you know, hide, stamp out, shame our history. Now I am in the 21st century able to stand proud and celebrate the entire journey thus far. Do you think there's a freedom in wearing your hair in its natural texture? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Because like rainy season now, you could legit go about your business like normal. You know, you don't have to be running for cover or worry that you know your hair is just going to suddenly be ruined by the weather. But more than that, it is being able, like to stand in a truth that this is a choice I have made. And you know, a choice that you you have made yet, but being able to be comfortable with it and not feel as if you know there's this societal pressure, or familial pressure, or you know any other external factors coming down on you for making this choice. Where you could, like I said, in terms of not just choosing a style, but celebrating all different types of textures, right? To be able to wear it just comfortably, wear it without any reservation wear it without feeling as if you know there's a problem with it or you are mm -hmm. trying to make some sort of you know extraneous statement just wear mm -hmm. it with the knowledge that this is who i am and this is what i want to be this is what i want to do this is a way of expressing myself and like having that comfort that freedom is definitely very important today how difficult it is to retain to natural hair for somebody who has been wearing um or using relaxers and um, um processing their hair for years and years because like um you know some people start relaxing their kids hair because they say it's unmanageable right you're relaxing their kids hair at a very very young age and then you grow up almost you know going to your teens into adulthood with processed hair when you have that type of hair how 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 difficult is it now to retain to your natural growth your natural hair Yes. Well, I um, always maintain that this process is a journey. It's not something that's going to be overnight. So suddenly you just you know, flip a switch and ooh, we're in the natural world and it's all magical. <laughs> no, you have to start with your right mindset. So I'm going to tell you now, it's going to require a lot of patience. Yes, but you have to definitely be committed to all that your hair would bring. So in terms of the actual steps for transitioning, well, one, you would have to make the decision not to do any type of processing again. Right. So most people, they would just let it grow out and probably do some trimming as time goes along. So no more processing, that's the first step. You know, then you have to go look for products that will be suitable for you. And if you're saying that the case is that you've been processing for so long from such a young age, you don't even know where to start. Like I said, most of the beauty supply stores generally would give you, a, you know, an idea or direction of where to go. So once you are, like I said, going to be doing those trimming, you're gonna just, you know, basically let your hair flourish. <laughs> Try and nourish your hair as much as you can cut off all the process ends or for some people they just do they would stop processing for a few months and then just do what we call a big chop cut off all the process ends and you know oh, could you do that in. gradually yes where? so like I said you have different options right. so you could do like I said stop processing if you don't want to do the big chop yes you could <laughs> if it's not a big chop or you're just taking all everything off all at once you would just let it grow out like I said while while you're nourishing in here while they're treating in here and all that good stuff and let it grow out and you know just cut I would say a few inches or so every month, depending on you know your rate of growth and you know what styles you want to be able to do. So it is all about, like I said, your attitude, your mindset. Once your perception and you're open to this whole new journey, it is going to be very doable. What is your opinion on like you know they say like some um, African styles 
uh, th this is suitable for school and work, but this is not suitable for school and work. Are there styles that are suitable for school and work and, and some that are not? Um, in my opinion, once I, I maintain if it's healthy hair, however, whatever form it presents itself in should be accepted. And I know that, you know, there are rules for various institutions and some people have, you know, found themselves brushing, you know, brushing up against or finding some contention. There's some, you know, some issues with what style should be accepted and shouldn't. And I know definitely Bantu knots is a big deal in terms of being in the professional world if not being accepted. So Bantu knots, for those who wouldn't know, it's um, a style where your hair is wrapped on itself. I think it's called like pepper seed or um, I think somebody else, I saw it in Jamaica, I think it's called Chinese buns or something like that. So there are a variety of names. And most times, you know, from speaking to you know, my mother and you know, my aunts who would be in that older generation, they would say that's a style for at home, yeah, right? right? That's not something that you would come out in public with. So now, and the irony is you've seen Rihanna and you know, a lot of popular people wearing styles that have a similar style. As a, as a huge fashion. Exactly. Going to gala events. Magazine. Going to yes. gala events. Right. In way. Bantu not. And that's exactly right. it. Where people still believe that with your natural hair, okay, if, if you're saying, yes, I want to go natural, it has to be done in this certain way for it to be accepted or for it to be professional. So like I said, certain styles or certain ways of wearing your hair would be acceptable for home or for certain events. But when it comes to school, it has to be, you know, slicked into a bun. When it comes to being in a professional world, same thing, it has to be in a worn or going a ponytail or something like that. And the reality is everybody's hair is not going to work the same. The whole process of caring for your hair is not going to be identical. So you to come and tell for you to tell me as an employer or as you know administrator in school that my way of wearing my natural hair, healthy hair, <laughs> right, is inappropriate, I will always have an issue with that because at the end of the day, like I said, clearly you are not doing the required work in terms of, you know, not just my heritage, but in terms of hair education. The same bantu knot is a very big protective style. So in terms of you wanting to wear it, it is not because, you know, I want to make a statement or I want to come up against the rules of the school. I am not trying to be radical. <laughs> it is simply a protective style that I am putting and installing in my hair for my hair health. And that's one. Two, if in the case of, let's say, in the working world, you do want to be a radical, relative but radical right. for the <laughs> radicals we, out yes, there okay. right for the radicals out there who want to wear the style to make a statement that too to me is acceptable because as i maintain if it is healthy hair what is the problem why are you telling me that like i said i have to conform to the extent that my freedom of expression is being constrained or even more than that that Except like my healthy hair, you are telling me only certain styles are acceptable. That's me. You can wear your hair natural, but up to this point. Like up to this point. Yes, or I think like a lot yeah. of the times, like I said, it would require things that could possibly damage your hair, right? For the from the repeated having to do that. So let's say most people they would say, well, okay, if you have time to do bantu not, so why don't you have time to just you know put it in a bun or put it in you know, at the end of the day? I have the right to choose you know what does or doesn't happen to my hair but more than that if it is for my healthy hair journey if it is like i said not affecting anybody to say you know it's not like it's a style way you know the, the things with extensions that you know would physically block people from seeing let's say you're at school right and you have your hair like in a big puff or something like that and it's blocking people from seeing apparently or maybe your 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 operating machinery, machinery or something and you like have that. your hair yeah. flying yes of yes course. i could understand right. that but like I said, depending on your length, your texture and all of that, once it is in, like I said, a style that is in keeping with hair health, I don't see why it should be a problem. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for having us here. And uh, we commend you for, you know, having your store here to encourage people to use their natural hair, wear their natural hair, groom their natural hair. And we thank you again. Yes, well, thank you all for being here. It's exciting to be able to share, you know, this healthy natural hair journey with the world. Andre Loveless, who are you? Where you come from? Where you started? We saw your fashion designs on in on a New York um, catwalk. Yeah. Who are you? You want to know everything. Where you come from? Who trained you? Who are you? I am presently Orisha Lache Ogelana Ogunade. Andre Loveless as named by my mother. Um, I started the Nubian Experience clothing line in 2013 when I was looking for clothes to show my African pride. Not necessarily traditional or traditional style clothes, but more t-shirts with prints on it. And I wasn't finding it and it hit me, with, hey, better you do it, you know? So I started in 2013 with the clothing line. I, I from Salah, 
<laughs> I am uh, born and bred sour butter, yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Nubian. Uh, the name, the, I chose the Nubian experience at the time was while reading upon African history. Uh, there were a group of people from Africa's ancient uh, past that did great things. Uh, some of the advancements in like agriculture and things still applicable in today's world. And it always stick with me. Uh, and it just hit the Nubian experience and I, I, I stick with it from there. And what inspired you to get into African traditional, even well now we see an African modern wear as well too. What, what inspired you to get into African wear and yeah. fashion? As I say, I, I, I wanted to show my pride, showcase my African pride. Yeah. And I wasn't finding it. So when I started doing the t-shirts, I started with African symbols. Um, but then people started asking for the traditional clothing. Uh, and I started to provide it based on what was being asked. And then we, it went further. It just keep evolving based on what I see. And then because I was wearing it every day, I started to have ideas. I started to do my own design, like what I have on right now. I call this the dashiki tank. So we do them either plain with African cloth material on, on the ends or full but in a tank top style. So I started to produce my own ideas after a while. So how you ended up on a New York fashion uh, well, catwalk? Well, I don't, or how I your fashions nice, ended up there? Yeah, that's a nice, nice story, you know. Um, realistically speaking, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, most people don't appreciate people that do things in Trinidad and Tobago. Right. And in 2018, I was contacted by the Caribbean New York Fashion Week to take part. I tried, but I, I wasn't able to secure the, the funds necessary. Um, a lot of corporate citizens in the country rejected more, more pleas. You know? In 2019, they reached out to me again, and this time with the help of um, the Black Business Network, um, we were able to to take part and the rest was history, you know. Um, it was well received, the, the clothing line was well received in New York. People actually, I'm shipping orders right now for people who thought that I would have been back there this year. Oh, right. So it was well received in New York. We look forward to going back. So African people, when, so African people, when they were brought to the Caribbean, weren't allowed to practice African traditions. Because because of this, there's like a huge disconnect. How do you use fashion to reconnect? Right. Or how would you like to see people use fashion to reconnect? So what I do, the t-shirts are my canvas. The t-shirts is my blackboard. Right? Because I started originally only with African symbols. Because we have a lot of negative misconceptions and negative stereotypes about African symbols and African spirituality. And I saw the t-shirts as a way to teach. So I started with symbols on the t-shirt and the name of the symbol and what it means. You know, uh, now I, I, I incorporate a lot more African symbols. I started with Adinkra symbols from Ghana. Uh, we use symbols from Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, South Africa. We incorporate a lot of things from all over the continent. We also, I am an Orisha devotee. So you would see praises to the Orisha in my clothing. One of my t-shirts there is masks protected by the Orisha with a traditional African mask. So we want to also teach and bring awareness to African symbols and African spirituality via the clothing. Do you think it is not mainstream to wear traditional African clothes because of it being associated with slavery, suffering and hardship? And do you see that changing? Um, I don't think it is not mainstream to wear African clothing because of its associated with um, slavery or anything like that. I think it is not mainstream because mainstream does not endorse it. We are, whether we like to hate or not in Trinidad and Tobago, a very full fashion society. The day one of the people that we consider a celebrity wears it more than once, it will become very, very popular. 
we, we and when we hear it, we get when they embrace it, and when they embrace it, yes, then all of a sudden, the bandwagon yes, is yes, you have an yes. of them, yeah. Um, we tend to not think for ourselves in that regard, so it's not not just not because our boys are associate. I don't think that's one of the things we run from because of that. Because today we see on the other flip side, or the people who embrace it, we see the beauty in it when we see them come out. Like, like weddings, functions, everything like that. We see the actual beauty in it. Mm -hmm. But I think because mainstream is not promoting it, or the people we think is mainstream not promoting it, we don't see it on the regular like that. Yeah. Some say fashion is a statement of one state of mind. What do you want people to think when they, what, what do you want people to think and feel when they're wearing your designs? Pride natural African pride and I want to see clearly not superiority I don't think I am superior to anyone at the same time I am not inferior to anyone when I do this I do this enough I do this with a mindset of energy that when you put it on you put on a jersey with a map of Africa on it shows that you are proud of your African heritage and that's what I want to convey and I want you to feel when you're in the clothing. Sometimes you hear people say they can't afford ethnic clothing because it's too expensive. How expensive can these clothes get? And if you don't have that kind of cash, what is affordable? Emancipation is coming up. I don't have, I don't know, X amount of dollars to do our entire, you know, head to toe um, wear. Is it anything else in like affordable clothes that I could get in? Yes, I want to answer that question in two parts. Um, that's an excuse first things first. Because you will go and pay the same money that you think is for an African traditional outfit for a, a European style suit. Right? But on the other hand, I know a lot of people, they leave it on the assumption that it is expensive. Inquire. Because we have a lot of people making quality clothes here in Trinidad and Tobago. We also have a lot of people selling authentic African clothes. And it's not as expensive as um, as people assume it is. Yeah. Alright? Um, my stuff is very affordable. Yeah. What do you think people of African descent can do here in Trinidad and Tobago to uplift and encourage mending that bridge back to our traditions? Uh, one of the first things we have to do is understand, overstand that we have been lied to as a people, as African people, our the the truth about our natural traditions, our spirituality, our culture, in every aspect we have been lied to about it. We have been lied to from school, from preschool straight up to secondary school, straight to the university. You know? Um, we have to accept that. And then we have to accept that most of the things we learn, we have to forget it. Mm. And when I say things that we learn, I'm talking about when it comes to and relates to culture, tradition, spirituality, mm. African spirituality. When you accept that, then you want to, so all right, if this is not, because as an African, living in Africa, before the arrival of Europeans, Africa had its own spiritual systems. So yeah, people ask like myself, asked in 2002, okay, so why was before I was, I, I was enslaved? Before they captured me and made me in that slave, I was not Until Christian. Wait, exactly, wait. Yeah. what was I? So that's why today I can say that I'm a proud of the 14. And I, via people like my chief, have made the reconnection back to Africa so people that practice in that same spiritual system unbroken thousands of years. And we'd we'll be surprised in Trinidad how much learned people we have from right here because of our certain traditions, Trinidad never lose. So what we have to do is to can answer the question in a nutshell, we have to accept as African people most of the things we were taught about ourselves and the previous culture, tradition, spirituality is a lie. Alignment to keep us away from that very said mm -hmm. culture, tradition, and spirituality. Because any people on this planet, their strength 
is in their natural culture, spirituality, and traditions. Um, Dr. Marimba Ani said, your culture is your immune system. Mm. And if you're living in somebody else's culture, that means you're sick. To the other people, we are sick or we're living in someone else's culture. Andre, thank you so much for having what's up here. No problem we at all. We wish you a happy, healthy emancipation. And we wish you village would be open this year, but we can't. So, so to everybody... How do, we, how do we get your clothing? Uh, I am on Facebook and Instagram, The Nubian Experience. T-H-E-N-U-B-I-A-N-E-X-P-E-R-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, The Nubian Experience. Uh, you can contact us there, place your orders, look through, see where you want. We deliver or? Um, we, our store is located at number 6 Woodfoot Street in Arima, uh, obliquely opposite the Arima Fire Station. Um, we deliver based on what you order. Yes, we do. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for having me. So tell us in the comments how you connect with your African culture. Plus, look out for Freedom Fridays starting this Friday where we celebrate Black Pioneers in our community.